flaccid dysarthria, or flaccid as some people say, uh, is probably the easiest dysarthria to understand. Um, we all know what flaccid means. It means um, lacking force and weak in medical terms. So remember there are upper motor neurons which feed into the lower motor neurons. And there's also input from other extra, extra pyramidal areas, the cerebellum and basal ganglia and so forth, coming from other areas of the brain. Not very well, not anatomically correct here. Lower motor neurons, these blue ones, are also known as the final common pathways. Because it is literally the final pathway of all of the brain activity goes into the lower motor neuron, which just carries the signal straight to the muscles. So all of the planning and mediation of signals all ends up here at the synapse and travels down the lower motor neuron. So any damage to the lower motor neuron just results in that muscle fiber or group or entire muscle or um, entire pathway of a nerve just not working. There's no signal getting through or, th or there's a limited signal getting through or an incomplete signal. You could think of it like the power line network to your house. So it doesn't matter what sort of uh, fancy backup batteries and power generation, solar panels, whatever that the power network itself has. The final pathway for the electricity are these cables that run from the power line into your house. And if something happens to them, you're not gonna get any power. So in flaccid dysarthria, that results from damage to the lower motor neurons, which means that the muscles are getting literally no input or weak signals. So the hallmark feature of flaccid dysarthria is weak muscle movements. But you'll also get uh, reduced resting tone because your muscles aren't... Normally your muscles are semi-tensed at rest. You know, they're not completely relaxed. But if you have flaccidity of the muscles, then they just droop even at rest. Or at least the muscle fibers that aren't getting the input just droop. So then if the muscles don't get any input for quite a while and they're unable to tense and contract, then... After a while, I think it's a matter of weeks and months, you get atrophy where the muscle literally wastes away because it's not being used. So they're things to look out for, weak resting tone and atrophied muscle that indicates flaccidity of the muscles and possible flaccid dysarthria. So the causes of flaccid dysarthria are any conditions which weaken the nerve, the lower motor neurons. So common ones would be surgical. Um, I've seen people who have had surgery to the parotid gland, which uh, the facial nerve runs through. And if the surgeon isn't careful, they can sever that nerve or damage it. And then you get this flaccid um, facial weakness, flaccid facial muscles, which results in dysarthria. In particular, their cheeks actually kind of flap around as they're talking, which is a real issue. It changes the oral resonance, makes them harder to understand. But equally, surgery to the thyroid, which the recurrent laryngeal nerve runs through, can result in... Um, vocal fold damage. And myasthenia gravis affects the neuromuscular junction, the actual connection between the nerve and the muscle itself. So you might think of this as a problem right at the end here where it connects to the house. Looking at it from a more technical angle, you can see the nerve here connects to the muscle fiber. And I'm not going to go into detail here, but this junction here, things go wrong with the chemical signaling. And that builds up over time so that they, their speech might be okay to begin with, but after a certain amount of talking, it declines. And we'll have a look at an example of that. Another cause and a pretty bad one is MND, or ALS as it's called in the US. So motor neuron disease. Uh, MND usually results in mixed spastic flaccid. You can get varying degrees of each. Another one would be stroke, specifically brainstem stroke. So there's not many locations in the brain where you would get damage to the low motor neurons, but if it's in the, the pons'al medulla uh, low enough, you will damage the lower motor neuron, the final common pathway. And some other ones are trauma. So we did have a patient once who came off a ladder, uh, fractured the base of his skull, which severed his facial nerve on one side. And another common one is Guillain-Barre syndrome. You will notice it's A-I-N, not I-A-N. So it's absolutely not Gillian Barre. Uh, the French language likes to ignore final consonants, so you can pronounce the N or not, but just please don't say Gillian. So how flaccid dysarthria sounds, it depends on the extent of the damage. You might be, you might have damage to an entire cranial nerve on one side, or it might just be an individual muscle group. Um, so technically it doesn't have a, a uniformly characteristic presentation, but it will vary depending on what the impairment is. But most of the time when people talk about flaccid dysarthria or speech pathologists, they're talking about 
um, a more general presentation. In particular, those conditions that cause flaccidity across the speech subsystems um, and progressive diseases in particular, so myasthenia gravis, motor neuron disease. Whereas for surgical, for example, you're going to get a very defined um, impairment. And don't forget, dysarthria means damage to the neurological system. So if you have damage to muscles from surgery or something directly, that's technically not dysarthria. So looking at the speech subsystems, and we will get to some examples, respiration and phonation, more or less go hand in hand, but respiration, if you have something like MND or multiple sclerosis, which is also usually mixed dysarthria, um, you can get weak intercostal muscles, which means volume is just reduced. It's a different phenomenon to what you see in hypokinetic dysarthria, where volume is reduced due to um, you know, poor feedback and poor scaling of movement. They physically can't be louder. And hand in hand with that is frequent breaths. If someone's got uh, vocal fold weakness, they can't kind of valve the air, so it all rushes out every time they speak. And they might be taking a breath every couple of words, as we'll hear in some examples. So you might get reduced volume either due to respiration or vocal fold weakness, and you'll get more frequent breaths. You might also hear a lot of breathiness due to vocal folds not um, adducting properly, quite a common feature. You might have mono pitch, and you also get strider. So if the vocal folds are weak, when you breathe in, you can't open them fully, and so you hear this sort of <sighs> and you'll hear some of that in the in the examples. So I know it's not hugely helpful just to list a heap of features, but when you hear these, they should stick in your mind when we go through them. Um, articulation, you might have a weak jaw, uh, it'll be slurred and imprecise because the tongue is not moving properly or not moving at all really. The jaw may not be opening very much, it's, it's just weak articulation. So it's kind of your traditional idea of slurred, well this is it. And then resonance, a key feature of flaccid dysarthria, at least in these overarching flaccid dysarthrias, is hypernasality. It's often an early feature in some of the progressive diseases. And you can identify it in two ways. One is um, you can hear small kind of hisses when they talk coming from the palate. And because they can't build up pressure in the oral cavity because the velum isn't fully closing or not closing quickly enough, you get very weak plosives. So it's kind of like, um, you know, like for a, a pert plosive, you kind of hear That's hypernasality or my impression of it. So you can hear the plosives a week, but you can also hear that kind of sound coming out of my nose as I try and imitate it. Prosody is kind of here in mono pitch, but usually the rate may not be that slow because the muscles aren't bound as they are in spasticity. They're just weak. They're just not getting the signal and the person may not slow down because of that. And there are some bonus features to look out for, some of which we discussed. There's atrophy due to no input to the muscles. So the muscle thinks, well, no need for me to hang around. I'm not being used. You can also get fasciculations, which is the muscles basically twitching and it looks with the tongue the fasciculations just look like there's worms under the tongue like moving around very quickly you've got to be careful not to see them where they're not there because often when people show you their tongue inside their mouth it will twitch around a bit so you've got to kind of learn the difference and reflexes unlike spastic dysarthria where you get a strong gag reflex strong jaw jerk reflex there won't be the reflexes because even if the signal is perceived the reflex signal doesn't return because the muscles da the nerve is damaged. So you can use these things to help you differentially diagnose. Okay, enough talk. Let's listen to some actual examples. This next one is um, a lady with Mycenae Gravis, and she's been asked by the neurologist examining her to not take her regular medication. So she's um, in the kind of natural state, so to speak. And my senior gravis, as we said, gets worse with more movement. So the longer she talks, the more dysarthric she gets. So this is a pretty extraordinary clip. She starts off with just mild flaccid dysarthria, and by the middle, you'll see that it's quite severe, and you'll see a lot of the features we just discussed. And then he gives her an injection of Tensilon, which is the treatment for my senior gravis, and you'll hear she gets better again. So this one kind of runs the gamut of severity, and it's a very good example. And I should apologize for the sound quality. This is 
I've used this tape in other videos as well. It's an old record on a cassette tape which was damaged, which I then digitized and I've cleaned it up as best I could, but it's pretty bad, but it's too good not to use. It gets more and more difficult, doesn't it? Yes. How would you say the alphabet? So she clearly has some hypernasality that and her articulation's a little bit weak, but it's not terrible. And you can hear her, particularly in this next bit, starting to take gasps in. So she's running out of air more quickly, and she, when she breathes in, the vocal folds aren't fully opening. So they're making a striderous noise. I'm now going to ask this patient to read aloud. And you will notice how her speech becomes progressively feebler and more indistinct as she goes on. When she becomes very dysarthric, I will inject a small amount of an anticholinesterase drug intravenously. Five milligrams of edrophonium, better known as Tensimon. And if you listen to the effect of this upon her, you will observe how helpful such drugs can be, not only in the treatment, but also in the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. The ranger lives in the north. He used to be found in a room in Asia and in Europe. In the winter time, he makes his home on the hillsides. But in the summer, he comes down into the mountains. In the summer, the ranger lives in the forest, which he finds in the mountains. And in the winter, he eats the moss and grow on the hillsides. Very often, the moss is covered by heavy snow. But the rain came new to stagnants. It was great away in the snow. But the rain came new to stagnants. Oh, it was very in the mouth and the name. Probably at the moderate stage now, she's hard to understand. More hypernasal and starting to have those striderous breaths. And, and watch how often she's taking them. The rain is also useful to draw us in the open snow. It was very threatening. And actually, it's it's somewhat phonating as she breathes in, and not just, but it's because uh, the vocal folds aren't abducting much at all. Now I'm going to start the injection. So that's close to severe. You can still kind of understand her a bit. So I'd say you could still be more severe than that, but. Watch the change as she keeps speaking. Back to mild. But in the winter he gets some moss which grows on the hill slopes. Very often the moss is covered by heavy snow. But the reindeer uses his ants to scrape away the snow so that he can find the moss underneath. The reindeer is a large animal of brown or grey colour. He is very graceful and on his head he has great branching antlers. Oh, very good. Well, now will you count, see how you get on? Will you count? Count, sorry. Just count, yes. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. Sure, that's all right. Thank you. Do you have any difficulty in speaking now? None at all. None at all. Would you like to say the alphabet? I would. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, U, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. Thank you very much. So pretty amazing. She goes from mild down to nearly severe and then back to, I would say, normal speech. So if you have a patient turn up who says that they get more slurred as the day goes on or as they talk, 
um, get them to read a really long passage. In the early stages, it will take, you know, up to 10, 20 minutes for them to tire. And if that happens, you have a good suspicion of what they've got and you should send them to a neurologist for some treatment. Okay, this next one is a 15-year-old girl who has a malformation at the base of skull which is affecting the medulla, including um, the vagus nerve cranial nerve 10 bilaterally. So if you want to pause the video and think about what that would affect. Um, we're going to ignore swallowing, but hopefully you've come up with the velum, I mean pharyngeal muscles and laryngeal muscles. So let's have a listen. Her voice is severely breathy. We can hear audible inhalation, reduced loudness, audible hypernasality, and short phrases. Notice how often she has to inhale in order to speak because of the excess air loss due to paralysis of both vocal folds in the abducted position. My grandfather, you wish to know all about my grandfather. Well, he's nearly 93 years old. Now, it seems like her articulation is pretty good. It's just that vocal quality and the hypernasality. So this is an example of a more isolated flaccid dysarthria. She's got the issue of being breathy because she can't fully abduct the vocal folds, but she's also got the issue of inhalatory strider because she can't fully abduct the vocal folds. He dresses himself in an old black frock coat, usually several buttons in him. The long beard clings to his chin, giving those who observe him a pronounced feeling of the utmost respect. Hopefully by now, after listening to a few examples, you can hear that hypernasality, particularly in the plosives. But um, these AMRs will, will really make it clear. There's possibly also diplophonia, but it's hard to tell because on this recording there's like a, a five-fold echo, uh, so I'm not actually 100% sure there. And this recording is of an adult, uh, I think in their 20s, with a glioma in the medulla. Have a listen and see if you can work out which cranial nerves might be affected here. Who wants to know all about my grandfather? One is years old. So I would say it's cranial nerve 12 and 10 and probably others too, but her articulation is very weak. Um, she's highly hypernasal and she's also got an extremely effortful inhalation. She's clearly dragging air through nearly closed vocal folds. I'd call this maybe moderate to severe flaccid dysarthria because you can maybe just understand her. It helps that she's reading a text that we already know, the grandfather passage. Um, but this is clearly extremely difficult for her to speak. That's actually less breathy than the previous sample because her vocal folds are more adducted. Her problem is more in abducting them and, and you know, breathing normally and valving. And you'll actually notice if you go back and listen to the speech sample that most of her unvoiced phonemes are voiced because she's clearly unable to um, abduct her vocal folds. You can hear that rush of air out of the um, nasal cavity with the hypernasality. It's quite clear even in this bad recording.
It's like this kind of over the top of the plosives. This next one is a person with ALS, um, a form of motor neuron disease. And usually, as I've said, motor neuron disease, you get a mixed dysarthria, flaccid spastic. However, this person, uh, to my ear at least, has mostly flaccid features. Because I'm still just over ALS. Continue to be here. Everything else, still strong. Still dancing with the kids. It's just over this area here. So when I use my voice amplifier, I don't have to put a lot of pressure on my voice, which is muscle. Voice quality is actually pretty good here, but there is some hypernasality, um, but you can hear that articulation is very weak. Your voice is not a boss. It's mm, sorry, two muscles going across here on air, push it up and through. So with the amplifier, I don't have to see. I am whispering and you can hear me fine. So let's summarize. Flaccid dysarthria is characterized by weakness. You're looking for weakness without strain. The non-technical shortcut, you might think someone's been to the dentist and they've had injections that makes their articulation weak. And if you can imagine the same thing in, you know, the pharyngeal laryngeal muscles. And some shortcuts that might help you are fasciculation and hypernasality with emissions. Now, if someone comes into your clinic and they have dysarthria and there's not a clear cause, sometimes that's the only presenting symptom and it's really important to do a thorough evaluation and then send them with your evaluation to a neurologist. Because you'd be surprised how often people have dysarthria that's gradually getting worse and they don't think it's a big deal, but they eventually come to see a speech pathologist just to be like, hey, what is this thing? And it can be very, very serious. So. Hopefully this helps you get a bit more familiar with the feel of flaccid dysarthria as well as the technicalities.